Okay, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna talk about demand, or more properly, the functional form of the demand functions that result from our consumer's utility maximization problem. So our central topic is then to think about how changes in price and income affect consumer demand, make a distinction between normal and inferior goods, ordinary and Giffen goods, and supplement, substitutes and complements. Supplements. All right, so we've already seen how to determine the consumer's optimal choices, right? You set up the utility maximization problem. If we have convex preferences, if we have Cobb-Douglas preferences, or if we have quasi-linear preferences, you can take the ratio of, of partial derivatives of the utility function with respect to both goods, set it equal to the price ratio, substitute into the budget constraint, and you've got a tangency. If you have perfect complements, or if you have substitutes, you don't have a tangency condition. And so then you've got to be a little bit more clever, and we saw about how to solve those. We found the optimal, we found the optimal actually, Marshallian demands, which gave us the consumer's optimal choice of, for instance, good X as a function of the price of good X, price of good Y, and income, and the optimal choice of good Y as a function of the price of good X, price of good Y, and the income. What this is doing for us is telling us that the, these objects, the optimal choices, are themselves functions such that if prices change or if income changes, the consumer is obviously going to buy a different bundle. And so now we're going to explore what those impl the implications of that fact. So using this notation, we can now think about how demands for a good will change when income and prices change. This is comparative statics, which is really important in economics more generally. And so in particular, we want to see first what happens when income changes, then we'll see what happens when prices change. Think back to basic econ, think back to like econ 101 or principles level class. We define normal goods as those where if your income rises, you buy more, consumers buy more, and if your income falls, you buy less. Inferior goods as those where if your income rises, you buy less. And if your income uh, if your income rises, you buy less. If your income falls, you buy more. So that's this exactly right here. We can do the same thing using calculus or kind of like by inspection of our utility functions. So we say a good is normal if the consumer's demand for the good increases in income. So if I take the partial of my demand function with respect to income and sign this as positive, we know I have a normal good. If we, have, if we sign it as negative, we know we have an inferior good, right? This is just the partial derivative of the demand function with respect to income, right? And so in other words, when income gets bigger, the entire function will take on larger and larger values if we have a normal good. If you have an inferior good, this gets signed negative. I take the partial derivative of my demand with respect to income and sign negative. That tells me we have an inferior good. All right. So here's with indifference curves what's happening. And so this is where both goods are normal. What's happened is we've got this collection of indifference curves. We've got our budget constraint. The original budget constraint is in gray. The new budget constraint is in black. Originally, we were consuming this bundle. Our income rose. We ended up buying, what, more of good X. We actually bought more of good Y, too. But this is telling me my demand for good X is increasing as income rises, right? As income rises, think about this X, these endpoints. It's M over P2, and here it's M over P1. As the M rises, income rises, this shifts out. And what's happened, my income rose. I ended up buying more of both goods, actually. Suppose good 1 is inferior. Now what's happened? Well, here is my original bundle. Here's my subsequent bundle. My income increase, right? We have a rightward shift in my budget constraint that's corresponding to an increase in income. But look where my optimal bundle went. The tangency happened up here, which tells us, yes, I've, I've consumed more of good two, but I've consumed less of good, less of good one. Good one, therefore, must be an inferior good because as my income rose, I bought less of it. I know I bought less of good one because bundle two is closer to the origin. This is zero. X, this horizontal axis gives me the amount of good one that I'm consuming. This is further from the origin than this one. So the second bundle has less good one. It actually has more good two. So um, here we have a situation where good one is clearly inferior. The other thing you could do is you can kind of like stare at what happens. I've used these arrows to just say, what's the direction of the change? So. If income rises, income rises will have a larger numerator. Larger numerator means a larger fraction. So, in, so demand overall rises. Here again, if income rises, here's part, part one, part two, part three. If income rises, new, larger numerator means this overall expression is going to be larger. So my consumption of Y rises, right? A consumer with preference with Cobb-Douglas preferences is going to regard both goods as normal. 
What about perfect subs and perfect compliments? Ah, I should have separated this out and made a separate collection for subs and compliments up here in my heading. Anyway, so let's think about what happens to perfect subs. When, oh no, I'm, yeah, I'm so, all right. So he, he, perfect subs and changes in income, not changes in prices. So here when income rises, what's happened? Income's entering the numerator as well. So an increase in income implies the demand for the good rises, right? So as M rises, so must my demand of both goods. So a consumer with preferences, perfect subs preferences, regards both goods as normal. Hey, the same is true for perfect complements as well. If you remember the perfect complements functional form, income is in the numerator as well. All right, so consumer with preferences described as perfect complements regards both goods as normal. We can show that. We could do this formally. You could take this derivative. You can't differentiate the utility function, but you can differentiate the demand. This has a derivative, right? You could do that with a quotient rule if you wanted to, but you could instead do that with a product rule. You write this as m times the quantity px plus py to the minus one. And then you could do it with a product rule. Anyway, so you could take the derivative like I showed before for, for uh, this right here to demonstrate that we have, whoops, it'd be this one, to demonstrate that we have normal goods for perfect subs or for perfect complements. All right, what about with changes in price? So now consider how the consumer demands change in response to changes in price. A good is ordinary when the consumer desires less of the good when the price rises, right? Just follows the law of demand. So I'll take the partial with respect to X, uh, sorry, partial with respect to the price of good X. If it's negative, sign negative, that tells me that I'm buying less. My demand is decreasing in the price of that good. That's what most goods are. We say a good is given when the consumer desires more of that good when the price rises. So when the price rises, you buy more. That's weird. That violates the law of demand. Now, I should say a little bit more so that there is no confusion. When we're talking about GIF and goods, we're talking about a very specific reason for the consumer desiring more. It is because a GIF and good is strongly inferior, right? So I told the story about Abercrombie and Fitch, which has been like a mail order uh, company. And then the CEO decided to raise prices and people bought more. That's not telling us that Abercrombie and Fitch is a Giffen good. There's something else going on. There's network effects, there's status signaling effects, and those are distinct from Giffen behavior. Giffen behavior is actually not observed in the wild. Economists debate about whether or not it actually exists. We teach it, especially in the intermediate micro course, because it helps reinforce the relationship between the substitution effect and the income effect. That's all we care about. You don't, you've never encountered a Giffen good. They don't exist, let's just say that. However, they're interesting to study because they help reinforce your logic about Giffen behavior or about the consumer behavior. So Giffen behavior is specifically where we have a strongly inferior good that occupies a large part of your budget. The reason why is because you have to have something where a consumer is buying a large amount of that good, the price of the good rises, because the price of the good rises and they don't have good substitutes and they keep buying it, they are now relatively poorer. Because they're relatively poorer, they're going to buy more of the inferior good, so they're going to buy more of the Giffen good. So the demand is going to rise while the price is rising, but it's because of the income effect. All right, so then we have, let's see, we say goods are substitutes if demand is increasing in the price of the other good. We, had, we have complements if demand is increasing in the, is decreasing in the price of the other good. So substitutes, if the price of the other good rises, I buy more of this good. That substitute behavior complements the price of one good rises, so you buy less of both. All right, so that's all this is saying. So let's look at Cobb Douglas and price changes. Oh, my demand for good X only includes my price of good X. So my demand for good X is invariant to changes in the price of good Y. My demand for good Y is invariant to changes in the price of good X. That's important. Notice also these are ordinary goods. If the price of good X rises, this is in the denominator. This be the derivative of this thing with respect to X is sign negative. It tells us if the price of good X rises, I buy less of good X. If the price of good Y rises, I rise buy less of good Y. So these are ordinary. They're neither subs nor complements, at least as we're defining them here. For perfect subs, indeed we have we have substitutability and we have we have goods that are ordinary. When the price of good X rises, the consumer buys only Y. When the price of good Y rises, consumer buys only X, uh, assuming we had like perfect substitutes where the marginal utilities were both equal to one or whatever. All right. And then for perfect complements, we have the situation where, well, if the price of either good rises, you buy less of both, right? It's really easy to see that if either the price of good X or price of good rises, price of good Y rises, 
that causes demands to fall. I'll say more about Giffen behavior a little bit later on in a different lecture. But um, anyway, so here we analyze the effects of demand due to changes in income and prices. We illustrated this with examples of our commonly seen preferences. And we made this distinction between normal and inferior. Normal is where my income rises. I buy, I buy more. Inferior is where my income rises. I buy less. So this would be the derivative of demand with respect to income is positive. Derivative of demand with respect to income is negative. Giffen is where the price of the good rises. I buy more of it. So this would be the derivative with respect to price of the own good rises. Here, ordinary goods follows the law of demand. Complements, the price of the other good rises. So I buy less of both. So dx dpy would be negative. And then here, the price of the other good rises. So I buy more of the good under consideration. So dx dpy would be positive. All right, sure hope you enjoyed the video.